Hi, folks. Welcome to another episode of Film Study. This is Ken McCusick. We have the happy task of discussing the offense from this big win over the Seahawks. And here to do that with me is Jeremy Kahn of 105.7. Jeremy, how are you doing? What's up, Ken? Thanks for having me, man. You always uh, join our show for two segments every week, so it's nice to return the favor and talk some offense with you. Great. It's uh, great to have you, of course. And, and I really love doing that show, i got to say, with you guys. You guys all seem to like each other a lot in the morning. It's a it's a fun group of people to go into the studio and, uh, and uh, spend a half hour with. So we're pulling the wool over everyone's eyes. They think we actually like each other. Is that what's going yeah, on? Good job. Yeah. Guys. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But no, it is, it is fun. Holes do it out, but yeah. yeah. Like, look, we have a good time with it. And I think it's one of the cool things, um, it, you know, when you're working in radio is that, you know, there's some give and take because we're all going to get beat up a time or two for opinions, takes, whatever it may be, just being able to go with the flow and take the beating when it's your turn to take it, I guess. Uh-huh. Yeah, there's, there's always people, there's always listeners who who hang on your every word. Believe me, I, I get a lot of that on this show as well. Uh, okay, well, uh, another game where, and this is great to be in this position, where we're left considering, was this one of the greatest games in Ravens history in terms of the dominance of the result? Uh, obviously against a good team, again here. We talked a little bit about this on the defensive show, but uh, I have this ranked on as number eight of all time games. I made a list of the top 11 uh, other games that, that were big for you in history or, or, you know, maybe some talk about this game in terms of just what was special about the dominance for you. Do you mean like overall performance or offensive performance? Or were you either? Okay. Um, you know, and a lot of it is defensive in this game because, because what they did on defense is probably more impressive, frankly, than what they did on offense. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of weird hearing some of the numbers come out. I know this is an offensive podcast about what the defense has done. Interesting to see if they can keep this up for a full season and stay relatively healthy. But yeah, a lot of the dominant performances I remember from Ravens games. Um, I mean, you think about that Miami game week one with Lamar and how crazy that was. Um, a lot of times going up against rookie quarterbacks, this team has seemed to feast upon them in years past. And, uh, you know, so you, you look back at some of those games where it's like, man, did that guy really throw four interceptions or have, you know, have a bad performance because of how they played? But from an offensive standpoint, this is probably one of the better ones I saw this year. Maybe a little bit more impressed by the Lions game just because of how they were playing um, and in how everybody was talking about them. But that being said, I do think this is an excellent win and, and hopefully some building blocks off of it, too, because I saw a lot of cool things. Like this is a game where Lamar didn't have the, the shock and wow from a statistical standpoint. But now he leads the league in completion percentage. So what more can you say about him? Because I think you can win any type of game with him at quarterback. Yeah, I mean, it's I, he's. we've certainly seen that against the Lions and in this game in terms of a 357-yard performance, I think it was against the Lions and a, and a near-perfect quarterback rating and really making less of his opportunity set in this game. And we'll get to that a little bit later in the show. Uh, but but now that the, you know, the run game goes for 298 yards and we find a new superstar running back you know, all of a sudden, which I think is one of the cool things. It's, it's super exciting. Like we were, I don't know how you feel because we get it all the time in uh, preseason and where people are talking about, Oh my God, this guy, he's going to be great. He's got to be on the team. You can't put him on the practice squad. Somebody will steal him. In recent years, I remember Jaleel Scott and not to say any of these guys were bad players, but like ultimately looking at the league, you're going to look at it and say, yeah, he's probably a practice squad player. And that's kind of how things turned out. Uh, Sometimes with running backs, it's a little bit different. You see something in, how they hit the hole. I mean, I, I remember this starting with Gus Edwards because I thought some of the talk was relevant about him. It's like, well, is he going to come in and take carries away from somebody? But ultimately he was impressive. And now Keaton Mitchell seems like he has another gear. And I think he brings something to the table that we haven't seen from a lot of the guys. Justice Hill, I, I thought he had some of that home run hitting ability. Haven't seen it as much, but uh, I really liked seeing that. And I love the fact, I don't know if you saw the text message chain with the family and how they were all going back and forth on social media. Uh, somebody screenshot. It was really cool to see that they were all excited and trying to predict what type of numbers he was going to have. And nobody could predict it the day he had. It was just insane. S- send me a link of that. I'd, I'd, I'd just love to see it. Uh, is Obviously, uh, for those of you who don't know, Keaton Mitchell's father is Anthony Mitchell, who had one of the biggest plays in Ravens history in the 2000 uh, playoff game win at Tennessee, the 24 to 10 win. It's actually in January of 2001. My greatest day as a fan, bar none, until the Mile High Miracle. Uh, yeah. And, and you know – it's just it could not have been a greater day in terms of all the things that that, that happened. But, uh, you know, the two greatest plays in, in Ravens history before the Mile High Miracle, both in that game. Number one for me, right. his head and shoulders above the others is the is the Mitchell punt, ret- the Mitchell block field goal return, rather, which Keith Washington blocked. And then, the, of course, Ray Lewis uh, intercepting the ball and really sealing the game at that point. 
That was more, was like an interception or was that just Eddie? I'd like to have this. Please give that to me. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So uh, either way, you know, like, look, nice. Uh, those are nice memories. And the fact that you got that kind of early in the Ravens tenure here in Baltimore mm-hmm. really kind of, you know, set the table for him to look for it. And then you get it again in 2013, whether it was expected or not, because, you know, that season was so weird with Flacco and it just shows you, you got to get in and you got to get hot at the right time. And then anything can happen. Right. I, I mean, the 2012 season definitely was not the best of the Ravens teams of the early Harbaugh era. In fact, I think it was the worst of the five. But the mm-hmm. 2000 team was a was a special and very different group that you we kind of had a notion early in the playoffs that this might be a team that will go all the way, even before the Tennessee game. And, kind of, uh, and then, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to ask you, have you looked at any of the other um, – Notor- yeah, you know, when people talk about the great defense, the Steel Curtain, mm-hmm. Purple People Eaters, 85 Bears, have you looked at any of them and tried to compare them to the 2000 Ravens, or is that a lot to ask? Like, to- uh, no, that's not too much to ask. It is something that almost every you know Ravens analyst has has done at some point in their life. Um, the 85 Bears are an interesting case because people want to compare the 80. They want to talk about the 86 Bears, really, who allowed less points. But mm-hmm. then they want to include the 85 Bears postseason with the 86 Bears regular season. I find that hilarious. Yeah. yeah like, Trying to put two different things together yeah. to make it yeah. seem better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the 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 Eagles of 91, I think it is, are the are the other team who's who's in the discussion along with the 2002 Tampa Bay Bucks. Um, the Ravens played a very easy regular season schedule, which is a legitimate knock on on that team relative to some of the others but they played a very tough postseason schedule and that was their best defense. They played the entire year, allowing four defensive points per game. So I'm very much a a proponent of the 2000 Ravens defense being extremely special. And I think people who want to exclude the postseason are just being very foolish about it too. Yeah. And, you know, I wanted to say this too. I know we're going to get started and looking at some different things, but uh, I think it's pretty cool in Baltimore. And the guys, we all talk about it when you leave, we all say nice things about you, Ken, when you leave. Um, but no, like in all seriousness, to have somebody that breaks down film like this and to really look at this stuff, like even when you and I talk pre-show, like I'm not going to be able to break down the offensive line for people, um, the way that you can and the way that other people can, I can look at certain things. I can make my predictions. I can look analytically speaking and all this other stuff, but to have somebody that's really doing this, like if you wanted PFF, you got to pay for it, you know, and Mm -hmm. you're doing similar things to them. Um, as far as putting a product out and for people that get a chance to, to kind of hear this and hear it breaking down uh, or broken down, I, I think is a pretty cool thing. So hats off to you for doing this, man. Appreciate that. You know, yeah. I, 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 the, the person I always have to take my hats off is my wife. She uh, does an incredible amount of work on this. And I, I cannot even read my own handwriting a lot of times after I write something down. But Maureen comes up with these beautiful, you know, handwritten notes that are that are very easy to use to put together articles and whatnot. So I, I, I couldn't do it without her. See, see, Ken, I couldn't do that with my wife. So you're you're in a better <laughs> position. I had to explain to my wife the other night why Craig Kimbrell pitches the way he does um, with the the kind of looping thing and the arms out. And and then what an infield fly rule was uh, just. She's a lovely lady, but uh, sports is not her strong suit. All right. Well, that's uh, we all got <laughs> things that we, we that we connect on. Um, OK, so uh, let's talk about some new things here. Terrific performance by the offensive line. Fifty percent ample time and space opportunities in this game. We talked a little bit about that. We'll get to it with Lamar about making the most of his opportunity set. I did want to kind of review a look back at the trade deadline now. And obviously, one of the things that comes out of Mitchell having the big game he had is that the Ravens are very lucky they didn't get a running back. Yeah. And and you think he has staying that this is something that can be replicated. This wasn't some one hit thing. Like, I, cause it looked to me in the beginning of the year when we got to see him in the preseason. And then of course now, like he hit that hole and I want to give credit to the offensive line there that the touchdown run, but I mean, it was just great watching him get up and down the field and the ability to make guys miss as well uh, is something that I think is pretty special on this young guy. That that's the that's the thing. I mean, first of all, is the is the is the thing replicatable? It's absolutely not replicatable. It's completely unsustainable at fifteen point three yards per carry. Well, or <laughs> nine for one thirty. You, so you understand what I'm saying there. But but yeah, it, the thing that was really special and looks like a special trait that we can really clash onto is the tackle breaking ability. And he ran with power. It wasn't just speed. I mean, he was running through tackles. And I know that Seahawks team was tired. Um, but you know, and, and particularly in the second half when he was running the ball, particularly with with um, Tyler Huntley in the game, they'd already played a ton of snaps. 
but they, you know, they were make he was making them look like children running through their tackles. Um, but the only thing that stopped him was that piano that seemed to jump on his back towards the end <laughs> of his long run there. Uh, yeah, yeah. He got tackled by Woolen. A little winded there, but you know, like it is kind of the cool thing watching a young player. And I know as a, as a fan, anytime they find somebody undrafted or a late mm-hmm. round draft pick, I always thought like that was such a cool thing because you know there's there's some scout that's high fiving or that's doing a fist pump because that's the guy he saw and that he recommended. And then now seeing them come to fruition and, and they've done such a great job, not only with running backs, but what kickers. I mean, you can look at everywhere on this team for undrafted free agents that have come in and had success in this league. Yeah. It's, there's only a few positions where you, where you have real trouble doing it, but uh, you know, they're not going to find their left tackle probably as a UDFA, but they're, but they're, Good chance that they can uh, find running backs, linebackers. They've been terrific with the defensive linemen, unbelievable. So they've been they've been great. Uh, I, I you know we've got you on, and Jeremy, you're really known as not only the 1057 gambling expert, but a guy who who uh, you know is a is a, a both a punter and a. Uh, <laughs> I think you you also do some work in terms of the the uh, uh, selling picks or something, right? Yeah, so I, I have my own website now. It was something we worked on over the years. I really. Like ultimately, I didn't want to become what's considered a tout, a guy that's selling picks. Like I would have rather had a company hire me and pay me to give out picks and do shows and things. And I was working on that and it didn't come to fruition. So we went the route of launching our own site, trying to keep everything as cheap as possible. I think it's like less than 30 cents a day um, if you subscribe. But again, I also give out a ton of free stuff. I have my own YouTube channel with concrete locks and it's two ends. I always tell people this in gambling. There's no such thing as locks. But when I got a last name and it's con. I, I had to create concrete locks, so it had to be put in there. But um, but yeah, like it's 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 a big thing about teaching to me. I love teaching people about gambling, the right way to look at things, the wrong way. It doesn't mean we're always going to get it right from a, a standpoint of wins and losses per se. But if you're, I always look at it this way: I'm not a results driven guy. If you're doing things the right way, the results will come, and I believe that in handicapping as well. Okay. All right, I, I very big interest in gambling personally, and and uh, uh, we got a few things we want to look at this week. Is uh, the first of all, I think I, I mentioned the spread incorrectly because I'm seeing now the spread is minus six on this game. All of a sudden, I thought it opened gone up minus four and a half. Yeah, it, it did, and then I, I saw it at some five and a half late yesterday afternoon. Some fives out there, but yeah, quickly gone to six. Okay, so uh, and and there's a lower lay on the Ravens. At six, right? Or 105, 105 to make one hundred. So that means it's it's like five and three quarters, or whatever you yeah. want to call it in terms of the pick. So, uh, anyway, some sort so, of reason. So, can, what that typically means? I'm sorry. What that typically means is that the line just went up. You know, so it just went to um, that point at six, right? So that's why you're getting the minus one hundred five instead of like the minus one ten that you would find on the money line. So that, typically, that happens when you see a line move early. Like sometimes. When it's getting ready to go up or down, you might see like minus 125, and then boom, it goes down a half a point um, in, in whatever sport you're playing. Okay. All right. Well, this uh, uh, obviously, do, do you have a, do you have a, a uh, selection or some advice relative to this game? Does, it, does the line stick out to you as juicy in either direction? Yeah. I mean, with divisional games, it makes it a little bit more difficult. I hate, I hate betting Ravens totals, and, and last week should be a perfect example why. Or if you want to look at the London game, because this is a team that typically, I mean, if they're kicking field goals, the game's going to go under. If they're scoring touchdowns, it's going to go over. And I know that sounds silly to say, but we've seen it both ways in their offense. With a team that dominates time of possession the way that they tend to do, um, it can really eat into that clock and change things up. So, And then they typically have been a team that plays to the clock in the fourth quarter if they have the lead. They're not going to do anything silly. They're just going to go out and run their plays and try to pick up first downs and keep eating up the clock. Um, I would lean Ravens here. I just – the Browns' defense is, has been outrageously good. Um, I still think it's a little bit different when you face a running quarterback, their run defense. Um, you know, they gave up 17 points to Seattle and quickly shut it down. I don't think you can look at last week and take anything away from it because that was just such a bad performance um, by Arizona. I mean, just dreadful. I, I don't know that they could have looked any worse than what they did in that game. And I don't want to take anything away from Cleveland, but, you know, they are missing their two their left tackle and right tackle, it sounds like. And we'll have to, I know, like, Wills will be out of the game – I'm, I'm wondering about the other side and the shuffling they're going to have to do. And with a team like the Ravens that's leading the league in sacks, it's like that looks like they're going to feast this weekend, or they should. So I would lean Ravens right, right now, but I, I'm not making an official play or anything yet because we're still early in the week. Okay. 
And are, when you say the right tackles out, do you mean Conklin or do you mean somebody else who replaced him Con- during the Conklin got banged up, right? So he was yeah. he's been out for uh an extended period of time, I believe. So yeah. yeah. So missing your tackles and going up against a team that schemes pass rush really well doesn't look like um, you know, a, a mixture for success. Right. It's if, at the very least, it creates discontinuity on that offensive line. So a lot of things the Ravens have done really well in terms of Full of, making offensive lines nervous have been good. And they have a really good history with Watson of making him nervous. In the, in the 2019 game, they sacked him seven times. And Watson was coming in one of the hottest quarterbacks in the league. They just put him in a cage and w- used what I u- call Star Wars trash compactor pressure from the original Star Wars movie. You know, we yeah. had the trash compactor. And the, the thing is, is closing at a rate that is just ridiculously slow. And, and yeah. you know, but, but putting Watson in a cage like that made him very, very uncomfortable. And he just feeling that pressure is coming kept his eyes you know from from staying downfield appropriately so i would really love to see if they can duplicate some of that or if watson even at this point in his career four years later is still vulnerable to it i've seen a bunch of his games and the one thing that you just brought up the pressure where i watched him in houston i never felt like the pressure really got to him he was hit quite often but it always felt like he was in those games making big plays late in the fourth quarter i watch him now and it almost seems like the pressure is getting to him He'll get rid of the ball a little too quick. Uh, sometimes he'll hang on to it and he'll try to roll out, and he's still looking downfield. Uh, there does a, appear to be a disconnect. It seems like Elijah Mitchell has come on a little bit more, and Amari Cooper's had some big plays. But ultimately, um, I just don't know about Deshaun Watson. I, I thought he'd figure it out at some point, but there are times I watch him, and I'm like, he doesn't look like an upper echelon quarterback um, at this point of his career. All right. Well, so the game is an interesting wager, and I always like to look at futures lines as well. In particular, futures lines are very analyzable for, for mm-hmm. an actuary. You know, you go in and you you see what's the, the, the first of all, you can you have oftentimes several sources where you can bet that may have a different price on the same event. And so you get an aggregate line out of that, and then you can see how much juice is in the aggregate line. Uh one thing that's that's interesting about this, the Ravens DPOY candidates. They had four guys posted at the beginning of the year, and two of them are still up at least. Uh, Roquan at 100 to 1 and Gino at 100 to 1. Do you like either of those? I mean, I would probably lean more to Roquan just because of the name recognition, but it's hard to ignore Gino's interceptions if you're going to bet it. I don't think there's anything wrong with those long shots, but you know as well as I do in this market, it, it, it tends to go to guys that are sacking the quarterback and then guys that are getting interceptions or one of the which, you know, you're forcing fumbles, or if you have one of those magical season where you're just kind of filling up the statute across the board. And it has become kind of a who's who um, and a popularity contest. Like Aaron Donald's name is always going to be mentioned. He's one of, if not the best defensive tackle in the game right now. Um, Matt Abike has been playing out of his mind. So like I'd have no problem sprinkling something there if you could find a line on it. But um yeah, it's kind of difficult to look at those future markets because ultimately you're going to need the interceptions that Geno has. But I've seen years where guys have gotten double digit interceptions and lost the guys that had 18 to 20 sacks. So keeping your eye on the Miles Garrett, um, TJ Watt and um, who's the other cat I'm missing? The uh, uh, Michael Parsons. Those are the three big names. Joey Bosa or Nick Bosa won last year. So those names will all be in the mix. Um, it's just a matter of can any of these guys put up those type of statistics to really get people to vote for him. Right. It's a, it's an interesting one. One of the problems with Gino is that if the Ravens defense goes off and, and, and reaches a historic standard, it doesn't have to be the 2000 defense. It just has to be one of the really great defenses of all time, um, which I think they're capable of, you know, in ter- particularly in terms of relative to the era is, is that really going to favor Gino that much? Because there's going to be players all over this defense who will be scamming votes from it. Basically Matt Abike, Roquan, Patrick Queen, Kyle Hamilton, you know, it could even be players like Clowney get consideration if, you know, he's had a tremendous pressure year, obviously. Uh, it just doesn't seem like there's an easy path for Gino to get there. No, because he's not a household name um, across the board in, in, in the NFL. But I would say this, too. If you keep stacking those interceptions, they will have to recognize you. Your name will be brought up, much like Diggs from the Cowboys when none of us were like, I'm watching him going, OK, he's got a lot of interceptions, but he gets burned quite a bit. You know, and uh, with with Gino, it just seems like he's always in the right place uh, to make those plays. And I don't want to discredit him because we, you know, we've had those conversations. System or player, what if it's a little bit of both? And he's just playing because he was he graded out better than he got drafted. Um, he slipped in the draft. Yes. I think the Ravens found a fine with him out of Iowa. 
Yeah, they, they he was a PFF darling uh, back then. And, and you know, honestly, the, the good thing about the, him being a PFF darling was that's what really got me interested in looking at Geno Stone as a prospect. But I didn't think there was anywhere he was anywhere near the 53rd best player in that draft, which I think where they had him. Yeah. But he got in the sixth round. I'm like, you know, the price is now right. And I was tweeting about it at that time. And then they drafted him. It was, it was the coolest thing. So uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, let's look at one more other thing. I know you're a fan of Devoa. The Ravens uh, have one of the best Devoas ever through nine games. I think they're third behind two 9-0 and o teams, the uh, 91 Redskins. And the, I think it's the 2000 The Patriots. Patriots. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and starting off the season. So go ahead, yeah, you finish up. Well, the, the the point was that you know being being where they are right now, the uh, playoff odds report has them at twenty three point four to win the per- percent to win the Super Bowl. So almost a one in four chance. Whereas nine point five to one is available currently. Maybe it's eight point five to one. I think it's nine point five. No, I put I I always set my decimal. I have to kind of remember how I do it. I think it's eight point five to one is uh, is what is being offered. How do you reconcile two things like that? And are you enough of a Devoa fan that you say, wow, that price is fantastic. I can't pass it up. It does, it does feel pretty fantastic. Um, I'd be all over the Ravens right now to, for a future bet um, to, to win the Super Bowl. To I think the odds were great. And if you jumped on it, I was actually on them at the beginning of the year to win the division, to win the Super Bowl, all, all those things. Because I thought when you – I mean, they were like two to one in a lot of places or even plus like plus 230 in some places. And you're going, wait a minute, did, did they not watch when Lamar stays healthy? This team is going to be fighting for the division lead every single time. And now watching them, again, it's a big if. If he stays healthy, they should be a team making a push towards the Super Bowl. It's just some of the demons or whatever you want to call it in the postseason. They got to get over that hump. And once you do, you're fine because a lot of guys get labeled with that. But I do think this is a, I don't like calling him a live dog anymore because people are going to be on him. This is a team to be reckoned with because when you have the top 10, defense offense top five defense offense or anywhere in that range you're going to be in a lot of games and you can have a down game and still find a way to win it and that's what Lamar does quite a bit when uh, when other players aren't stepping up or when things aren't going the way the Ravens of course in their in their playoff history have a tremendous amount of success and a lot of that has come on the road with great defense um you know I I, I kind of am feeling like the number one seed is awfully important for me as a fan because I definitely want to see the AFC Championship at home sometime before I die. But mm-hmm. but that so that would be nice. But in terms of how well this team travels, I think they're fairly well built to do it in January. Yeah, run game and defense, right? Isn't that what always travels, or at least what we've we thought works well on the road? And if you can take that with you, the other thing we have to see is, um, and I do think there's some legitimate questions about Lamar and the elements uh, if you get a game like that, but. If you're going to go deep into the playoffs and you're hoping to play games in Baltimore, there's a chance you might run into some of that. But, um, you know, I, I want to see more of it. I want to see him in the postseason. I, I, and I'm not like other people. I want to see him play the Chiefs. You know, I don't want the easiest road to the Super Bowl. I like all. I, I want all the smoke. I think that's the way we talk. All that smoke. Bring it on and let's see who they, if they can stack up those W's. But I think there's a lot of good teams in the AFC. All right. All right, it is definitely a stacked conference. Well, let's get back to the offense here. We have a lot to talk about today. They outsnapped the Seahawks 75-47 in this game. And by the way, the Monken offense had not really been delivering snap count wins in these games. And some of that special teams, you know, onside kicks, but some of it's also turnovers um, and uh, giving the ball up early on drives and not converting as often as they probably should have. And also being a little more explosive than past years, which had – you know, basically played keep away with the football with a lot of three downs and 12 yards kind of advances of the ball that that uh, tend to hold it. But lots of offensive snaps to spread around in this game. Yeah, and, you know, like I've been kind of waiting for some of it. I, I saw some criticism of Todd Munkin early on in the season. Like, what's the difference between this and that? Like, I think people forget, too, you're installing a brand new offense. You've got players that you haven't worked with before. We were getting the stuff figured out with the quarterback. You had some injuries early on in the season. Your starting running back goes down and all these other things. And you got all these new pieces you brought in. Hell, you brought in all these new wide receivers. So you need to build, develop some rapport, work through. If you're going to start running more screens, you got to get the blocking down on screens. It's things that we haven't seen here in years past. So I am excited about the offense. And I think some of the designs have been really cool. Um, and I think they have the weapons now, finally. So I always use the, the term, no more excuses when it comes to it. And I don't mean it like, you're making excuses, but now you have all those weapons. 
Now we're going to find out whose fault it is, you know, moving forward. Because I do think Munkin is a great offensive or a very good offensive coordinator. Thought Greg Roman was too, but left a little bit to be desired in the passing game. Um, so I am excited to see how this looks moving forward. But so far, it seems like it's building and it's gotten better a little bit each week. So, uh, In terms of no more excuses, are we now at a point, is it fair to say that Monken has no more excuses the rest of the season? He's had long enough to uh, uh, get his ducks in a row and get the offense rolling. I think that's fair. And I, when I say no more excuses, I mean for both sides, the Lamar haters and the, La- and the Lamar detractors, you know, like, because there are so many people or, or Lamar fans, because Lamar fans will say he didn't have the weapons. Well, now we have the weapons. Now you have a new offensive coordinator. So we get to find out, you know, and, and it's not, we're not, we probably won't know the answer in one year, but we'll see what it looks like over time um, of how they, these guys are going to work together. But I, I, I'm excited for it because, you know, and all the people that call in, like we had people calling in on Monday being negative about this game. And I'm like, what on earth could you guys have watched outside of ball security, which I'm fine. We can bring that up. Mm-hmm. That was negative in this game of in a, any aspect of the game. So um, yeah, I, I do think that uh, things with Munkin are going to be much better, but yeah, no more excuses. Okay. All right. Well, they, they, they've been effective in the red zone. They're now 26 of 40 on the season, but only three of six in this game. It's really three of five because they kneeled out the end of that game. And that's something that always, Sticks in my craw, but the, they're on the. They, they should be two thirds now. They're at sixty five percent, which is a difference between sixth and fourth in the NFL based on on what happened. But the good thing is the median's at fifty three percent, and I'm kind of feeling with the league leaders in the seventies, the low seventies, that sixty five, probably sixty seven, is sustainable for a well above average offense like the Ravens seem to have. It should be. Um, you know, you look at the way that especially with the weapons that you have now too. I think a key part of it is going to be staying relatively healthy, right? Um, any, any sort of changes to offensive line could change things up quickly and, you know, could obviously change up what you want to do offensively. But I, I think fans have to be excited about the completion percentage and how it's gone up and just how the offense has looked in the past couple of weeks. Maybe some questions about the Arizona game, but ultimately I don't think it was ever in doubt. Yeah, each each of these games had a little bit of problems in terms of how well he performed relative to the opportunity. So I want to I want to table that for just a second. We I promise we will get back to it. Series success rate is something I always like to look at. It some people call it drive conversion success rate, I believe. But the Ravens had 29 first downs in this game, and I'm sorry, that's not correct. They had 29 of 36 times that they converted a first down, including start of a drive, into a subsequent first down or a touchdown outstanding 80.6% rate. The league leading totals are at 78% for the season, Miami and Kansas City. And um, this is one of the areas where the Ravens need to stay at a fairly high level to maintain the quality of their offense. It's just, you, you can't drop too much in that area. By, by the way, this game, Seattle, 35% in this area, which is the lowest figure I've ever seen. I, I'm sure there have been lower, but but it's the lowest figure I've ever seen. You're talking about for a single game? Uh-huh. I mean, oh, wow. Seattle in the '70s, one one game when you know I was a kid had had one first down the whole game. Um, Oof! So uh, that would have been lower, but but this is this was uh, absurdly low. God, that just sounds weird to see something that low uh, from from a team that you consider good, and like that's what always gives me pause a little bit, uh, Ken. When people are like, "What do you think about the game on Sunday?" and when I see them play really well, like I'm not trying to be negative about the game. I'm like, I'd like to see that more often. And the weird thing is I really do feel like the talent here, they're capable of I'm not telling you got to beat everybody 37 to three or anything like that. Like a win is a win, but you know, there are times where you could dominate some games and not worry about it as much as Ravens fans have in the fourth quarter over the past year. Yeah. Well, I mean, if, if we're a little bit shell shocked in terms of, of losing 10 point leads from 2022, but in 2023, they played some really dominating squeaker games, like the one in London. I mean, that that game was nowhere near as close as 24 to 16 in total. No, and the one in Arizona was nowhere near as close as a seven point game. It just ended up that way after you know an onside kick got recovered, and the, the Ravens with a nine point lead had basically a chance to kneel kneel out the clock or kneel three times, leave the Cardinals at the one yard line. 99 yards to go down nine at the worst. And <laughs> they instead decided to punch it in and, and, uh, and it didn't work out as well because they left a lot more time on the clock. But anyway, you, it, you didn't bring up the Colts game, right? Like that one too. Well, like that's another one where, oh, 
or the Steelers, you know, in yeah. terms of 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 uh, things that have gone wrong late in games. But yeah, you know, the Ravens are honestly they should be eight and zero, and and uh, it has not worked out that way. I think somebody said if you flip the one score games, the Steelers go to zero and eight, and the Ravens go to seven and one because they still lose the Cardinals game. I I, I didn't <laughs> actually verify that that was true, yeah. but it's uh, it's an interesting way of looking at it. It is, I, you know. So, I, and we we talked a lot about the Steelers too. Just speaking to that, of you mentioned those those uh, one score games that they've had, they've been outrushed, outgained by a lot of their opponents, and keep finding ways to win. I think a lot of people would just tip their cap to coaching there and saying that you know, maybe he's pulling the right strings at the right time. But again, I, I don't know how good. Like, if the playoffs started today, all four AFC North teams would be in, which is such a weird thing to say with how loaded the AFC appeared to be at the beginning of the year. Yeah, a lot of people, I mean, I think during the season have even said that they didn't think the AFC North was was the best division. And I think we're back to that point right now, that, that it really is the best division in football. We'll uh, we'll see if that continues the rest of the season. There there are some holes in, in all three of the other teams in the division, frankly. Uh, I, I You know, for all of what Mocken was going to bring to this offense in terms of pass-run ratio, we've seen a, a very balanced team. 41 run, 34 pass. And this game, obviously, a function of game script and what was going on. A lot of choice involved in the way. But it, it feels like this offense has great balance. And I've been looking you know, at the run-pass ratio and been surprised, even with the wins, at how run-heavy this offense has been. So let, let me throw something back at you about that. So it, obviously, they didn't get rid of the run game. And I'd say get rid of, like, people worry about, like, hey – this was really working. We need to tweak some things in the passing game. Um, but ultimately, when you look at it and you see the way that Munkin's offense has been run here, the only thing that I would question is taking more deep shots. Do you want to see them go downfield a little bit more? Or would you consider each play with this team and the ability to have too valuable to – I don't know. Saying too valuable to take deep shots is a wrong thing because obviously if they catch it, it changes the field, pass interference, field position changes. Um, but there are some teams that value those three plays that they get to try to get 10 yards more so than wanting to take a chance of throwing it down the field. There's an ancillary benefit from getting um, 10 yards on three plays as opposed to getting 20 on one. And, and we, we don't have to debate this for any, any great length of time, but possessing the football and forcing the defense to play three snaps against you is very valuable for tiring out the opposing team. And you, you keep your own defense fresh and off the field and it's very positive. The Ravens do have, you know, if they have one weakness right now in terms of potential rotational tiredness, it's on the defensive line where they play 2.18 defensive line snaps per play. And they have five guys to share those. And if you work that out, that's 43.6% of the snaps. Each of those players has to play on average, which if you play a normal number of snaps is just too darn much for a defensive line to play. That is one of the reasons why I would kind of like them to go out and get Indama Kung Su here as a sixth defensive lineman. And they don't really have anybody currently on the practice squad that I would trust to come in and fill in at a reasonable level. So it'd be somebody like Sue or some other defensive lineman I'd like to see. It'd be interesting to see if they actually uh, bring him in, if that works out, adding a little bit more depth even after the trade deadline. Yeah, he's a he's a vet men guy at this point. I think he you know he said the Ravens had contacted him already. So um, you know it's, it'd be interesting. I, I I hope it hope it comes to fruition. Uh, Ravens hadn't been taking any fourth down shots recently. They took a couple in this game. Um, one on fourth and one was converted by penalty. Another was converted on fourth and two by a Lamar Jackson run. And then they had a third where they actually kneeled on fourth down to give it up. So the, the notion that they were one of two on fourth down is is garbage again. But uh, this was Seattle was a peer team. I don't think the, the the Ravens really took a chance at any point where the where the game was in question. But um, this is a team where you would be allowed to take more risk against a team that's that's a more quality opponent, and you're you're um, not one where you cl- clearly are better than a team over the long run, and you want to reduce risk, even if it if it's slightly if you take a slight win probability hit, you're taking a big gain in risk avoided to take that small hit. And I like doing that against a, a, a bad team. Yeah. And, and Ken, with the, with the math adding up, are you more analytical when it comes to fourth down or do you kind of very, very is it mix and match? Yeah. I, I, yeah. I am too. Like I, I don't, there, there is a feel to the game and I think there are times that you can lay it up and play it as some people would perceive to be smart. Uh, but I talk about this all the time when you're looking at it, when to go for it on fourth down, I'm not telling you to go for it on your own 20 
you know, because I, I don't, we don't need to do that. You don't need to play silly when you have this type of defense. You're still going to play it smart, and you'll lay it up, to use a, the term, um, a little bit more. But, like, they're so good, and the advantages are going to be in their favor to pick up these short yardages with how they run the football, with having a guy like Lamar back there that can create time. Um, so I do like it when they go for it, even when they don't get it. But I, I always try to use it in my mind and say, before the play happens, would I go for it and mark it down so I can talk about it the next day? Whereas most people are like, did it work? We shouldn't yeah. have went for it, you know? Yeah, that type you, of thing. you're going by the results. I hate that too. But, you know, the, one of the big ones in Ravens history was the game they won against the Chiefs 36-35 in 21, right? 21? Yep. Yeah. I think it is 21, yeah. Okay. So early season game, they went for it on fourth and one instead of punting the ball where they might have pinned the Chiefs back around the 10-yard line but give them a minute and a half to drive for a field goal. Um, were you for that going for it on that fourth and one to try and seal the game before the play as opposed to punting the ball there? Yes, that guy on the other side is so frightening to give the ball back with any yes. amount of time. I think that gets thrown around too much. Oh, you don't want to give him the ball back. He's the one guy that I definitely don't want to give the ball back with any time. Yeah. And and I know sometimes pe- teams will play it up. You know, like you might be a little silly with, oh, I wouldn't score here. That's third down. You want to wait till fourth and try? Like, no. You, sometimes you got to score, and then you got to let your defense go out there and play. But if I had my druthers, yeah, I would. I would like to run some of that clock down and give him as little time as possible. Yeah, and with uh, in in the case of of that particular play, I actually think there's a pretty broad set of quarterbacks that I would not want to give the ball needing. 50 yards and having four yeah. downs four four down football is so freaking easy in the NFL right now with completion percentages being what they are. It's, you know, first of all, everybody knows how to run the two minute drill. So it's not, not even an issue in terms of that. They don't even really spike the ball anymore other than, you know, in the final 30 seconds or so to stop the clock. I mean, it's, it's really about passing over the middle of the field, getting the line of scrimmage quickly, running a set of plays that you already know and have scripted for exactly that thing. Everybody in camp, if you go there, you know, runs that two minute drill and they know exactly what they're doing for that. So it, it's just, it's so freaking easy right now with four down football. Yeah. And, you know, like you're giving more plays that like, all the advantages are on offense right now. I always get, I don't know about you, like there are little things that really upset me. It's third and 30. I know you don't have a third and 30 play and then teams hand the ball off. I'm going, I'm, I'm throwing a pass. I'm th- even if it's a five yard pass, I'm throwing yep. something because if a guy gets out in the route, you got, to pick up 30 yards, all he has to do is tug on the jersey, bump into him. It, it could change anything, but teams continuously go, okay, we're just going to kick it back to him. Yeah, yeah, if you I, have the right I, I quarterback, you can throw that. Yeah, I, I agree completely. I think that, that you know, you're know you always better off trying for defensive holding, illegal contact, any of those ticky-tack little penalties, and they will call them. You yeah. know, you would, you know, so it's great. Uh, let's move on. Talk about Lamar's performance in this game. Um, I always like to talk about how the opposing pass rush, you know, went after him here and they went after him with five plus on nine occasions. By the way, this is one of the things I just tabulated up when I got home. If I'd had this for the radio this morning, I definitely would have talked with you guys about it on air, but there were nine occasions where they rushed five plus that's 35% of the time. And Lamar on this place was nine for nine for 88 yards, 9.8 yards per play. So they just did him a favor to rush extras and get them out. And looking at the last couple of weeks and, and what's happened, I think that's been generally true. The more pressure that's been put on Lamar, and in this case, it was just numbers that didn't actually necessarily convert to pressure. Um, he's he's done much better. And the, the big the game was two weeks ago against the Lions when he had 22.4 yards per play with pressure. But he's still a seven and a half last week and a very reasonable 4.0 this week. And uh, opposing teams... You you send numbers against Lamar Jackson at your own peril. Yeah, I, was, I always wonder about that. Like, you know, I think you have to mix and match of, are you going to blitz this guy? You're going to go like the big story was cover zero for the longest period of time, right? Go cover zero against them, even though that, that that's what Wink was running forever. They had some struggles with it, but it seems like I, I feel like everything has slowed down for him. Um, I always thought he was fairly decent at reading defenses, but now picking up the pressure, he just looks so comfortable in the pocket. And even more importantly, even rolling out of the pocket and, as I said the other day on the radio, like he had this great sidearm pass that he threw. We need to bring those up when he throws it and completes it for when everybody goes, oh, I hate when he does that, and it gets batted down. Like sometimes he does make the right decision with it, even though it's not – you're probably more in the fundamentals of uh, – yeah, I don't know, Ken. How, how do you feel about some of the sidearm passes for as I, long as it gets our, there? Arm angles, reduce batted passes. It's pretty – It's that's pretty well a uh, – a, a, reasonable assumption to make. And he doesn't get that many passes batted relative to yeah. the quarterback. So yeah, excited about it. 
Let's see a little more of stats on Lamar. A four man rush, sixteen times. He only threw for 70, uh, 76 yards there, so four point eight yards per play. So you can see not not uh, nearly as much success. Although both of these are small sample sizes. Uh, with that one three man rush, a fifteen yard play. Um, half of the opportunities were ample time and space. That's the highest rate in the entire season. So thirteen out of twenty six. He completed ten out of thirteen for ninety eight yards. The 7.5 yards per play there was one of the disappointments in his opportunity set. First of all, he had a ton of these ATS com- opportunities, but second of all, he's short by maybe two and a half yards in terms of what he should have gotten on his ATS throws. Real um, paucity of mid-range throws in this game. Yeah, you know, and you look at it, you didn't, ha- you don't have to take the shots downfield. Um, I-, I, I just think he's been getting better and better as a passer every time we watch him. And you know, the knock on him early on was outside the hashes and deep. I still think there's some areas to improve on, but um, the touch passes, maybe getting better with the, the screens and things like that. Um, and, and how about, like, I, I talk about Pat Mahomes all the time and not to get away from the Ravens, but, like, I feel like Andy Reid makes it really easy on him. He throws more screen passes for touchdowns than anybody. That's one of the safest plays that you can have as a quarterback, um, you know, throwing that quick pass to a, to a wide receiver, tight end, running back, whatever it may be. But – that allows him also to get out there when he does the amazing things and all the other stuff. You have the underneath and you have the deep. You got to have all of it. I think intermediate, working it on all different levels. And I feel like Lamar's done a pretty good job of that thus far. Again, the one question I would have is should they throw deep more? But in the context of the game, sometimes it's not needed. They, I think they're in better position specifically with the arrival of Mitchell to do more with screen passes, because part of doing that is you still need to be stretching the field horizontally, sorry, vertically, horizontally also for that matter, but vertically when you run a screen pass. So you, you need to have, you know, a receiver taking safety attention deep. If you, if you possibly can have that. And that gets, you know, obviously fewer tacklers into a position where they, where they can make a play on the ball with he, Flowers having to take the wide receiver screens himself, that takes away a big weapon for pe- p- taking people downfield. And he's got four speed weapons on this team. I mean, no Ravens team that I can ever remember had four legitimate speed weapons. But Hill is a speed weapon in space. Uh, Duvernay is a speed weapon in space. Mitchell is an unbelievable weapon, it appears like, in, in space. And hopefully he's going to be used as a pass catcher some. And, uh, you know, of course, Flowers. So they, they need to, in my opinion, they, they really need to use Flowers for the kind of vertical threat he is, and we just have not seen that yet. He's, he's not running a lot of verticals at all, um, and, uh, and, and it's a little strange. I mean, I understand that you know a smaller guy like that you don't necessarily trust the same way you trust a bigger guy with going up and getting a football against a defensive back and being sure that it won't be intercepted, but still, he, he needs to be further down the field to attract the attention to a place where it will not disrupt the rest of the offense. Well, and it's, it's a, yeah, that, and also get, there's, there's part of it too, to saying that there is some value in throwing the ball deep to keep the, I mean, you got to keep the defense or make them respect it at least. Um, so if you are running your underneath, it helps. I, I do think everything in the game goes hand in hand, whether we want to talk about routes that are run to set up other guys, uh, throwing the ball deep to get the underneath. You know, taking the underneath to draw them in to go over the top, which play action, all those things. They're like a lot of stuff goes hand in hand. But um, but I would say this with Zay too, like he's the type of guy where you can throw the ball to a spot and he can run under it, you know. So I, I think that's valuable to have as well. And I would like to see him get out there more and uh see if they can't use him in space because he's he's just a weapon. Like I, I do think he's very comparable to a guy like you know, Tyreek Hill and Stefan Diggs. I think there's a lot that he can do, but um, I'd like to see more of it. It doesn't have to be all at once. We don't have to see it this week, but I'm hoping that some of that uh, gets mixed into the game because you never know when you're going to need something. You know, like you're in the postseason, you get down early, and maybe you want to start taking some deep shots. Yeah, uh, it, absolutely true. And, you know, the, the the guy they did take two deep shots to in this game was Bateman. And what was disappointing about the ball is Lamar really overthrew both, and he almost like overthrew them intentionally, it looked like. Okay. Um, they, they were both balls that – if he puts the right amount of air on that, Bateman is going to have a chance to go up that ball. He's going to have a chance to draw the pass interference. And you got to get to the point, if you're not there yet, where you trust Bateman a little bit more than you would trust, say, a Beckham to disrupt the pass uh, from being an interception. And certain players, you know, I, I honestly, with what happened in Pittsburgh, I really don't trust Beckham at this moment to disrupt that kind of a pass. I do trust Bateman. Bateman has shown all kinds of great trust 
come back for the football moves in the last couple of weeks that tell me he's ready for that sort of trust. It just, it, it looked like both of those balls were almost intentionally overthrown uh, by Lamar. So I hope there's more of that in, in the offense. I think uh, he's great. But if you throw some to Flowers, that's good too. Um, then it really is. And you, you, you mentioned throwing to a spot. I look at, I, I, I term it differently is you got to just make sure you out throw the defender and then Flowers is likely able to track that ball and, and hopefully get to it. Um, and, and, you know, in the process of beating that defender, he may well draw a flag too. You may, you may get held, he may get, you know, PI'd with the ball in the air and whatnot. So you have a lot of, a lot of potentially ways to win that play. Yeah, with his speed, you expect there to be a lot of chasing. So things that are thrown underneath, coming back for it, you get your flags, you have your opportunities. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with that too. Like, I think we're saying the same thing about spot and overthrow. Like, you want to make sure that only one person can get it, and that person is your guy. You know, like, and and Zay's speed and his ability to, to actually outstretch and make difficult catches, uh, I think it's only going to help out in those plays when you decide to go to it. All right. What else? I think we've hit on most of the things in terms of pressure, BOQ. Time to throw is 2.86, which is really kind of low given the numerous sample time space opportunities, because those are three second pockets that he had a, he had a chance to work with. But he didn't really have that one or two plays this week where he extended outrageously for four, five, six, eight seconds. Or like the Aguilar play was what, over nine seconds, I think, that, yeah. that uh, on, on the touchdown. So I, that, that was probably a little bit of it. Uh, a plus 16%. Uh, completion percentage over expected. This is a stat where Lamar has typically not looked good in the past. He's usually been under expectation, but in this game, I look at it and a plus 16 didn't really do him that much good in terms of yards per attempt as you'd hope for. Do you, yeah. Do you see anything in his completions where it's, um, is, is it more of taking underneath stuff that's helping him out safer throws or is he just evolving as a passer? Is it a combination of both? Well, I'll tell you the thing that that is certainly happening right now is he's got a higher, much higher intended air yards than completed air yards, and part of that is the two throws to Bateman were you know massive overthrows, and so they they have a large A dot with them, and they they bump up that average, but they're not completions, so they don't bump up the other average. Um, so he's, he's you know your screen passes tend to get completed, your short passes tend to get completed a lot more, obviously. He's had some ball placement issues, and in particular this game, I thought this happened. There was a screen pass to Aguilar that was thrown to the wrong side of Aguilar. If he throws that ball in front, it's a it's a five, six yard play, but he threw it behind him and ends up being a two yard play. Seems kind of minor, but it also gives Aguilar a much better chance to break a tackle and make a bigger play out of it. And, uh, you know, I've, I've, there have been some little ball placement things like that. By and large, though, the fact that Lamar's taking care of the football so well when he's throwing it, setting aside the fumbles for a moment, is really impressive. Yeah, I, th- I think like the last thing we would sit here and say with him is like the one thing that going into each game, my only concerns with Lamar are always ball security. And it's not always his fault. You know, it's not the quarterback position. You're going to have some issues where you turn the ball over. And then we've had the thing with Justice Hill twice. We talked a little bit about that earlier today um, on the handoffs and why that happens. But um, but, you know, like I, I still think overall as a player, he's growing like some of the people want to throw his name around MVP like he's going to be con- He'll be in consideration, but is he going to have the numbers to, to win something like that? We'll have to see what the second half of the season looks like because I do think statistics play a lot into that. Yeah, he hasn't had the five touchdown games or anything. A lot of it is dependent on him really keeping that interception total low and the offense in general humming. I mean, they're they're not the 2019 offense, not by, by any stretch. Uh, we will never see that offense again, much like we probably will never see the 2000 Ravens defense again. No. But, but – uh, <laughs> But it was uh, it was fun while it was there. Um, I want to move on a little bit and talk about some of the other scheming results. I think one of the real interesting things was the running back snap division in this game because they got a chance to do some things due to the nature of the game, the blowout. Um, Hill led with 48 of the running back snaps. Edwards had 14 and Mitchell had 14 of 76, which is that is a lion's share of runs for Hill. Um, in this game, and a lot of the workhorse finished the game out runs went to Hill. Okay, so w- like when you're looking at that now, um, and I, uh, two things here: this Ke- Keaton Mitchell eats into Justice Hill, right? That's you oh, believe yeah. that? I, I think he has to. Yeah. Um, 
And secondly, was there any concern with you over Gus's touches in this game, or was it just game flow? I, I think what happened with Gus was he had a toe injury early in the week that got reported. And actually, I think might have kept him out on Wednesday. And they just said, if there's an opportunity to get him out of the game, we're going to do it. But I mean, there's nothing about Gus's running that would tell you there's a problem right now. I think it's just a, it's probably precautionary. Um, I mean, he was 10 for 52 or something. Or no, sorry, 5 for 52 in the game, right? He had 10.4, mm-hmm. whatever it was. Yeah. So I, I don't think there was a problem with that at all. Uh, they didn't use him as a receiver in this game, which was kind of interesting. Um, uh, they did use Mitchell on 14 plays, but this is the other number that really comes through on this is Hill was in the game for 48 snaps and he got the ball as a touch 14 times. And I think 13 and one, I think was the, was the rushes and, and the, and the, he got one target as a receiver. Edwards got the ball five of his 14 as the, as the primary touch in, in the thing. So he ran the ball five times, no, no targets as a receiver. Mitchell is in there for 14 snaps and he got 10 touches. He is he did. so just to put it, 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 it percentage wise, Hill got twenty nine percent of his snaps. He got a touch. Edwards thirty five, and Mitchell <laughs> over seventy. So, <laughs> so they really love what they have, and they wanted to see what they have in this game. Yeah, I, I can't wait to see him uh, this week against the Browns, who we know have a good run defense. The Browns did go to you know Seattle and give up seventeen in the first, and then and gave up the what the fifty two or fifty four yard run to Kenneth Walker, and then they kind of locked it down all the way up into that final drive of the game. But uh, but it will be fun seeing a player of Mitchell's explosiveness, I guess is the right word to use, uh, go up against this defense. I, I love matchups. I like, you know, when you get the number one receiver going up against the number one cornerback, anytime Mike Evans has gone up against Marcus Lattimore and those two hate each other, I that to me that's appointment-setting football. So I like seeing a strong running team or a great throwing team go up against the pass defense or the best run defense, whatever it may be. Um, and I think this is going to be fun on Sunday. That that's it just shows a kind of level of knowledge that I'm dealing with here because you're you're that's a very deep cut reaching into the NFC South for one of their well, big matchups, you know. So. Yeah, but I do I I love those matchups like when Justin Jefferson if he ends up going up against Jalen Ramsey or what do we get we in the playoffs we got Devontae Adams going up against um, Jalen Ramsey and I still remember the the jet sweep that he ran to get Ramsey out of position and somebody didn't pick up Devontae Adams and he ran in the end zone for a walk-in touchdown on fourth down. And I, I still remember that play vividly. And I thought it was such a beautiful play to run at that point in time. And knowing that Ramsey was going to be out there pointing the finger, like you didn't help, you didn't help. And he got a touchdown, but I, I love great play designs. And I thought that was one of them. Fun stuff. Uh, we, we talked a little bit about Mitchell's power. You know, eight missed tackles forced on nine attempts. Just That's absolutely ridiculous. It's the number one stat coming out of this game for me, for Mitchell. His contact balance, just a, a thing of beauty to watch. And 132 of his 138 yards came after contact in this game. Just, just an outrageous number. Those feel like Derrick Henry type numbers. Uh, yeah. Not this year, but maybe four or five years ago. So, uh, you know, like he's... It was special. And again, I, some people can poke some holes in it. I think I, you know, the game time and where the game was and were those guys like Cancuning on three, ready to get the hell out of there and go back home. Um, but I, I want to give him, you know, his, his due because like watching him run, he didn't, t- no plays off, man. He was, he was running hard on every chance he got. And if you're a guy that's trying to earn some burn or at least get some plays, that's what you have to do when you're given your opportunity to show out. And he did exactly that. Well, he's he, unless he fumbles the ball the first two times this this next game, he'll he'll uh, yeah. he'll be a very significant component of the Ravens' offense. Uh, Edwards had four missed tackles. That was great. You know what's good about this game? They rushed for two hundred ninety eight yards, and Ricard was out there for just twenty three snaps. Hmm. It was there. We did see some different looks from players, like likely getting some some opportunities mm-hmm. out there and different things. So uh, they have. With the weapons they have on offense, and I know it sounds silly to some people, they can pretty much play whatever personnel they want. I, I don't think there's there's not something I'd look at and go, "Oh my God, they got three tight ends out there." No, it wouldn't. That wouldn't bother me. You know, if if that were the situation they had set up, like they have in a lot of red zone spots, if they wanted to go four or five wide. I think they could and include tight ends in that grouping, or even some of the running backs, depending on how you feel about them catching the ball. But it's it's definitely an interesting look, and I would love to see the five wide with Lamar as the running back at some point just to see what it looks like. Cause I think you could have some explosive opportunities and two minute drills with that. 
Yeah, I, I, there's certainly there'll be possibilities to do that. You know, the, the formation I kind of want to see him come back to, and they used this twice. Mitchell's first two plays in the NFL, one of which he caught a pass on, is the pony backfield. Get get uh, get an Edwards right behind Lamar, you know, and create a triple option essentially by having Mitchell to one uh, not in the backfield necessarily, but but as a flanker, somebody who jets across the, the the front of the quarterback, and you create all kinds of misdirection opportunities for the defense. I mean, Roman was great at that. That was what was really great about the Roman offense was the ability to stretch the field horizontally to create great point of attack opportunities for the for the for the run game. Uh, what what he you know, what Mitchell brings them is something they missed for a lot of 21 and 22 in terms of having that speed back. And it's just very exciting what he what he potentially can bring back to this offense. Yeah, and I think you look at what uh, Miami's doing down there and some of the creativity with the motions um, and, and guys like they're they even have one of the plays that they call the cheat play because of how you're able to get guys freed up and going towards the line of scrimmage and not getting flags on this. Um, it's a coach putting players in the best possible situation to succeed. And I'd like to see some of that from the Ravens because I definitely think they have the talent and the players to do it. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned likely back in the offense, a very big deal for, as far as I'm concerned. I, you know, I want as many players as possible. I want to see Duvernay back in the offense a little bit more than he has been as a gadget player primarily, but I want to see him more. Um, that was, it was honestly kind of an unfortunate circumstance for Devin this year obviously the, the receivers we didn't really have an idea Aguilar would be as good as he has been and he's you know certainly been a contributor um but if if they had known how little Duvernay was going to play they probably would have rather just saved the four million dollars I would guess too it's kind of sad the way that everything unfolds I don't want to say sad because things are working out great but like you overpaid for Beckham it's something that had to happen the Aguilar signing worked out um, you know, you bring him in and then I, I still think Duvernay's talented. I think you can mix him into offenses when you're bringing him on your team and you're asking him to be your number two or your number one. Maybe you're asking a little bit much, but I definitely think he's a guy that can play in the slot. And if you get him ball in space, he can make things happen. So, oh, yeah, you, you might be right on that, that, um, you know, with the way that things unfolded, they ended up with a, a lot of mouth to feed and basically not enough food. Um, so. I think when you're looking at some of these plays, because I was concerned after they made all these additions, I'm like, well, what happens now with likely and Duvernay? Are they going to, and it's not a like, Oh my God, they're not going to be able to get those guys the ball. But I just think they're talented players that you should find a way to get them involved. Now I, I want to ask you this because you, t- you take a lot of calls on the radio, obviously in terms of fans who are usually irate about something, because that's what happens when you put a is life fair <laughs> microphone up and allow or a phone number and allow people to call in. But it's, uh, the same people who basically wanted Beckham the receiver and ignored completely the notion that this was part of signing Lamar. And there are a lot of people that wanted Beckham the receiver. I don't care. He's it's, he's Odell Beckham. Why wouldn't yeah. he be great? You know, kind of thing. Those same people are the people who are saying you got to do whatever it takes to keep Matabike. Well, guess what? That eleven million dollars that they could have used to sign Matabike or a couple other free agents of some sort, or you know maybe have the money at least for the first year for three guys um, is gone to Beckham next year. It's, it's already been out of the 2024 budget. And uh, it, it's almost like, I feel like people who, who are get irate about losing players really need like a, a remedial cap education that, that goes with that. Just how the NFL actually works in terms of the cap. The problem is, is people treat the NFL and we've used this analogy over and over again, like it's checkers and it's chess. It's, it's not, it, you know, you got to think about moves next year. It's baseball. A lot of times because there's no salary cap, they do have, you know, the luxury tax. You can go out and spend money like the Texas Rangers did and go crazy two years in a row, spending all that money, then have guys get injured and then add even more money onto what you have to pay out by making trades and getting rid of some of your farm system to help out for this year. In the NFL, when you do that, you eventually have to pay the piper. You're going to run into the situation where you're like, we don't have money to keep this guy. And the Ravens have traditionally done a pretty good job of not running into that, but they have. They've run into that problem the same way every team does. Um, so you're right. But if getting Lamar back and made it, if it made it sure you were going to get Lamar back by getting Odell, I think it might be somewhat of a necessity there because you got the guy in the fold and you get your quarterback. But I agree with you. I mean, they vastly overpaid for him. And when his numbers came out from Vegas, you know me being a gambling guy, I was like, wait a minute. They're predicting, is this three and a half touchdowns and 500 yards? 
that doesn't seem like $15 million worth to me. Right. Um, but, you know, it's it could all be in, in what this offense is expected to do. They win a Super Bowl. Nobody's complaining about any of that. Well, you know, I, I'll still be complaining about it in 24 in terms of where the money went because he won't be the reason the Ravens win the Super Bowl. I should have said, <laughs> I, yeah, I should have said your average fan won't complain about okay. it. I do Sorry think people that, that, no, 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 because like when you're looking into those things, they do matter. Like Matt Abike is an, an absolute difference maker and you don't want to lose him. Um, but, you know, you might run into that problem now. Yeah. The, the other thing that is that it's just a fact of life for teams that draft really well. And no matter what like portion of the draft people want to show you that say the Ravens didn't draft well, the Ravens have been an exceptional drafting team for many, many years, both both in the Aussie years and in the DaCosta years. And it's the natural consequence of being a good drafting team and developing players from the undrafted ranks as well um, that you lose players. That is, and, and it's a heartbreaking process to go through, but you can't keep everybody. But no, the it's... alternative is terrible, where you have to <laughs> sign other people's players. <laughs> well, and that's where people get in trouble in the NFL. Like you fall in love with other people's players, you bring them in, and it doesn't work out. How many times have we seen that? Whether it's quarterbacks, wide receivers, like, man, that guy doesn't look like the player that they got or, you know, that we saw elsewhere. So, you know, and I was going to go back into my old bag. I remember when Peerless Price signed away from the Bills with the Falcons, and they were like, that's not the player we signed. And, you know, sometimes it's buyer's remorse after the fact, and you just got to deal with it. But I think routinely, I even say when people are like, oh, the Ravens had a horrible draft, and I go back and say, well, tell me what you would have done differently in that draft. And I'll even let you look at it after the fact when you know how these players look in the league. Because, you know, like, I remember the one year people was like, they should have drafted Le'Veon Bell. And I'm going, well, why did they need him at that point? In time? You know, I'm like, like be realistic about it. But um, yeah, you can poke some holes and say things didn't work out. I heard, uh, who was it? Dust, is it Dvorak from Oklahoma doing a, uh, he was doing the Oklahoma game this weekend. And I'm like, man, that was one that didn't work out in the NFL. And, and the Ravens have had a couple swings and misses. But for the most part, I think they've been one of the more solid organizations at draft. Uh, you you could score it a number of different ways, but you definitely get there. I'm going to forgo some of these other scheme things because I oh. think they're kind of minor. But okay. uh, uh, did you want to talk about something there? No, no, no. I just, I'm long winded, so I didn't know if I'm going too no, long. No, no, you're not. You're definitely not the problem. <laughs> Rabbit holes are appreciated always from the guests here. And it's always interesting to talk to you, Jeremy, because you have a lot of a lot of interesting things to say, some good gambling rabbit holes, some other good rabbit holes to take us down. But uh, we'll we'll uh, take a break here and restart. But Jeremy, why don't you tell people uh, right now where they can find you online? And how about your website, too? Yeah, at JCon Sports. It's J-C-O-N-N Sports is my Twitter handle. Um, I think it's at JeremyCon22 on Instagram. If if you want to look at all my crazy memes um, that I post on there. But that being said, yeah, and I have ConcreteLocks.com, which is my new baby. Um, I'm working on that. It's a, a gambling site where I'm selling picks and giving stuff out. We keep it dirt cheap. The one thing I always say to people is I try to keep – I'm transparent. I, when I win, I, I, I don't get too high when I win. I don't get too low when I lose. But I always have an answer, and I always show up. Like Sunday, I had a terrible Sunday, Ken. I showed up on Monday to do a podcast as much as I didn't want to do it. Uh, to tell everybody and, and face the facts of what you were wrong on. So, uh, but that's a big thing. We try to be transparent and not 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 rip people off like a lot of people do in this industry. Yeah, I, I uh, you know I know there's a lot of that. I know there's a lot of retroactive or people who post eight different sets of picks for three games so that they can always be right three for three yep. on one of them. We kind of think so. Anyway, uh, Jeremy, really appreciate you coming on. Other folks out there, if you'd like to be on a film study short. Hit me up with a DM on Twitter. They're always open. I'm looking for that 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 topic that's kind of minimized. So if you're talking about how the you rebuild the franchise from the ground up and hire every person in the castle, we don't need that. We what we need is something that's real specific about a scheme thing that we can get done in about 20 minutes and provides an alternative to draw people into the film study world. We hope so. Uh, that's how I meet people. I, uh, you know, I do over 300 shows a year, and and um, the only pipeline I have for meeting people or the major pipeline I have for meeting people is by people who come through the film study short process and, and talk to me about a topic. And then uh, that's like some, to not only some great uh, uh, guests to come on this show, but, but some uh, great friendships as well. So uh, always look forward to that. Uh, Jeremy, thanks again for joining me for this. Yeah, absolutely, man. Anytime you need me. And I, it's one of the things that I appreciate about a lot of local guys that are here doing stuff for Baltimore, because I think there's a lot of talented people out there that have their own platforms and I know you invite a lot of those people on to sit here and chat and chop it up. Um, but I think it's one of the cool things. Like I appreciate the podcasters and the guys that are writing articles for their own websites. 
just as much as the guys that are in the locker room covering the team because everybody has an opinion. Just base it upon facts, and and we're good. You know, we can always chat. So I, I love this stuff, man. I think you're doing a great job. All right. I appreciate it, my friend. And we'll talk to you next time on Film Study.